Let's now look at some examples for question 8 and that deals with the relationship between the teacher and students. Um, it's a particularly fascinating area for me uh, and what I'd like to do in this section is really hone in on the dynamics of power uh, between the teacher and the students. And to do that I'm going to use French and Raven's fantastic study on the nature of power uh, and the different types of power and how it's used in leadership. And then we're going to use that to understand firstly the four different types of relationships we talked about in our earlier video. Um, and we saw that in the nature of the um, communal sharing, the hierarchical relationship between the teacher and the student, the fact that there's some attempt at equality matching for the teacher, and finally the teacher looks for some kind of market pricing in terms of the student. We also noted that there was this complex relationship between teachers and students, which on the one side was definitely positional and hierarchical, and on the other side was more personal and open. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to give some examples of how this plays out in terms of power. Uh, so let's get going with this and let's start off with um, personal power that the teacher actually carries within um, him or herself. Now, when the teacher relies on their personality, on their relationship building, or the fact that they share common interests with the students and that common interests you can hear the story about the communal sharing it's when you kind of become like one of the students you show that you can be one of them you show that you're a person just like they are um, and what happens is you could be said to be using attractive power now attractive power can be developed through getting to know and emotionally investing in students. And here you can hear again, it's a situation where you're opening the line between the student and the teacher, and you're trying to be uh, one with them, together with them in a situation. Now, it can also, attractive power can also come as a result of the teacher having a personality that is perceived by the students as pleasing, uh, likable, funny, charming. Uh, and it is natural as well as strongly encouraged by our media-driven culture for students to want to follow and respect those who have qualities or who are judged to be cool. Um, now, you've got to be very careful with this personal kind of power. It is a wonderful and important kind of power where you just exist as a personality, as a character, which the students respond to on their level with your level. And there's a kind of a, a wonderful interaction as people that goes on in the lesson. But uh, as always, this is open to abuse. And here we have a situation which thankfully is blurred out of a teacher who tried to be too cool in the classroom. And whilst he's conducting the lesson, uh, he decided to show how a strip show worked and he proceeded to strip down to the waist. He was unfortunately for his coolness fired and not allowed back into teaching. Positional power is different to personal power. It comes, it comes in a, a very different shape and form because you get it just by the fact of being a teacher. So uh, by virtue of the fact that the teacher is in the position of the teacher, they have power, right? The, the governance of the school places each teacher in a position of responsibility for the management of the students in the class. So in one sense, it's not earned. It just is. But on the other hand, we can do a better or worse job of projecting that we deserve this role, that we deserve this power, that we are teachers. Now, this is especially true of new and substitute teachers. Uh, and I've seen this when I go on teaching practice where I try to tell the student teachers, I say to them, just act as a teacher. Be a teacher and the kids will respect you for it because you are a teacher. But they can't believe it themselves. They don't feel they're a teacher inside of themselves and hence they don't take on the role which is already given to them in the classroom itself. That gives you a sense of the difference on the one side between personal power where you get the power from your character, from your being, who you are. And then positional power you get from being in the position of a teacher given to you 
by the school itself. Now, you can use your uh, positional power in various assorted ways. And certainly, one of the key roles you have to work with is, is what's called coercive power. You have the right, as a teacher, to use disincentives, to say no, to withhold privileges, to give consequences or punishments to students. Now, when you do this, or when teachers do that, uh, we could say that they are exercising their coercive power. Coercive power implies that if a line is crossed, something will happen that will be less desirable for the student than if they choose not to cross the line. Now, no matter how much of the other forms of power a teacher possesses, without coercive power, some students will take advantage of their freedom to cross lines without concern for penalties. Uh, I've been a teacher for many years, and I know this to be the case. I would hope in my own instance to have had some personal power, and later on you'll see uh, I would hope to have some uh, knowledge power. But I've always had to make sure that when coercive power is necessary, it is used clearly and cleanly to ensure that the students actually listen. Now, apart from coercive power, you get uh, expert power. Now, expert power is different to personal power, which comes from your personality, and positional power, which comes because you are in the position you are, and that gives you the right to have coercive power, where you can punish and draw the line. Expert power comes from the fact that you know your subject and you, uh, are the, you are the expert in the know. Now, when the teacher is perceived as being knowledgeable, in the subject, well prepared and intelligent, they possess what could be called expert power. Now we have all had teachers who did very little to invest in the emotional quality of the class, yet were well respected and able to manage the class to a great degree due to the fact that the students felt there was a great deal of value in what these teachers had to say. So it's driven by the students' desire to know. Uh, and it also comes from a, a natural human deference for those who are perceived as wise or possess what could be called intellectual capital. And this is actually quite uh, irritating and comforting uh, in equal measure for me as a professor of education. Uh, it's weird how society suddenly gives you an immediate kind of status as being wise and they kind of defer to you. They assume you know more than you do. Uh, sometimes you can uh, certainly abuse that assumption or not live up to it. Now, in today's modern information age, it's not only expert power, it's not only what you know that actually counts as power, it's also your ability to actually give access to information. So, informational power. The teacher is able to bring about change in the student through the resource of information. Access to the right information results in a change of behavior. And power comes from the teacher knowing what the information is, where it is, and how to access. Now this can be transitory, uh, because once the information is given, the source of power dissipates. And this new information in new places is needed. Hence the continual drive to keep the learners going. But also you have to at some stage give some of your power over to the student. Empower the student. And that is through teaching them how to access information in their own right. Now finally you have reward power. Now this is a fantastic form of power which teachers should use. Uh, and reward power is basically when you are able to reward your students in many forms. Now, these rewards are usually employed to influence student behavior, and they include grades, recognition, prizes, praise, privileges, and anything else that could be assumed that students desire that could be given to them externally by the teacher. But over time, it may be desirable for the teacher to help foster intrinsic sources of motivation within the student, rather than developing an expectation that the only way the student will know if they are successful is if the teacher provides an extrinsic source of reward. In its uh, most healthy form, reward power is experienced as a deep affirmation and a willingness on the part of the teacher to recognize student effort 
clearly in its own terms. Now in terms of reward power, the teacher can either work with equality matching because the teacher has the ability to reward. The teacher tries to make sure that the teacher actually gives out equal reward to the students so that they don't feel that they've been biased in any way, so that they all feel that they have been given a fair shake. They're all being rewarded for what they do. And it can be very difficult to do this because you have to keep track of how all the students are feeling. And some uh, students demand far more rewards than others. They want, they want more response. They want more recognition. And other, te uh, other kids sit quietly in the background. But you have to try and make sure through equality matching that you give some kind of attention and reward to all your students. But secondly, you'll notice in this account that there's a kind of a market pricing mechanism where you try to give the student the recognition and the reward that's actually due to them in proportion to what they've done. You reward them to the value of what they've done. And you can see that in the last uh, kind of phrase there, where the willingness is on the part of the teacher to recognize student effort clearly in its own terms. Uh, and there you can begin to hear the dynamics that operate between uh, market pricing where you give uh, recognition for who the student is in their own value at that time and equality matching where you try and make sure that all the students have some recognition. And there you have a situation where we've now taken our initial account of how you have different kinds of student-teacher relationships and the positional and, uh, and personal relationships that go with that and then interrogated how they work with six different types of power that the teacher actually wields on the student.